Hi all, thank you for joining us virtually for a Mass CC Clean Tech Spotlight webinar series presentation. To briefly cover some housekeeping items, all attendees are currently in listen-only mode. We'll start by quickly introducing the webinar series, then we'll introduce today's guest speaker and let them present on their company and technology. If you have a question, Sorry, following the presentation, there will be roughly 15 minutes. If you have a question, please use the question submission feature and type it in as the presentation is happening, and I can ask them on your behalf. Now to give a short introduction to MassCC's work. MassCC's Tech Dev Program Suite consists of three different grant programs, Catalyst, Amplify, and Innovate. Each of these programs target providing support to clean tech startups and researchers at different points in their technical and commercial development, from prototyping to demonstration with industrial partners. Today's presentation, a Catalyst grantee, Daniel Cho will present on his company, On Vector. On Vector is de developing Plasma Vortex, a robust new water and wastewater treatment technology. Thank you again for joining us and please enjoy the presentation. Well, hello everyone. My name is Dan Cho. I'm the founder and CEO of OnVector. I'll, we have been a, a, a grantee of the Mass CEC Catalyst program and have benefited uh, significantly from that. I want to share a little bit about our company and uh, um, how we utilize the Mass CEC Catalyst funds. Uh, but first, I'll start if we can advance to the next slide. Um, to uh, uh, by describing um, a little bit about our, our core value proposition and then going into some depth uh, uh, on the technology itself. And then I'll, I'll wrap up uh, by uh, uh, talking through some of our recent commercial commercial developments. Uh, but you know, thank you so much for, for joining uh, this webinar. And uh, at the end of it, uh, we'll, I'll be happy to, to uh, take your questions. So if you can advance to the next slide. So the problem, that we are addressing is the high cost of treating uh, the very high strength, high contamination wastewaters. Uh, when you think about industrial processes of manufacturing, uh, whether it's pharmaceuticals, chemicals, petrochemicals, as well as remediation of contaminated groundwater, ultimately you have high strength streams that require disposal at centralized facilities. Uh, and in some of the uh, strongest uh, wastewaters that are hazardous wastes, uh, the uh, aqueous streams and sludges are in fact incinerated. And that results in extraordinarily high logistical costs and treatment costs, as well as uh, obvious uh, pollution impacts from uh, emissions, as well as uh, air, air, air pollution from um, the furnaces. And ultimately, uh, sludges and aqueous streams that are incinerated uh, are ultimately represent unrecoverable water withdrawals. Water that is destroyed uh, is not recoverable in the local e ecosystems. Next slide. We address this uh, using plasma. Plasma, which is arc lightning, uh, literally lightning uh, or ionized gas, is very robust and capable of destroying the most recalcitrant contaminants. And that results in much lower costs uh, if the treatment can uh, occur on site. And then the environmental impacts are, are also significant, not only reducing uh, emissions, uh, but also uh, water savings. And just remember, plasma is primarily a directed energy type uh, of treatment. So as we move into a, a, a more evolved uh, grid and uh, electrification um, environment, um, would, this is, in fact, a, a very clean solution uh, that, that reduces sludging and, and chemical inputs. Next slide. Our technology is called Plasma Vortex, and this is essentially a hydrocyclone that has been integrated with plasma. So it's very robust, and I'll walk through that in some detail, uh, but it's also very flexible. So. Uh, plasma vortex works in any water quality, regardless of the salinity. And this has been one of the key obstacles for plasma technology in the past. Uh, because water is conductive, 
it creates a short circuit when you apply energetic fields. Uh, essentially, uh, you have short circuit quenching. So electrolysis, delivering electricity to water is easy, but igniting lightning and fire reliably as a plasma solution is actually quite hard. We've overcome this uh, through a proprietary method, and we've also integrated a stretching uh, method uh, to increase the exposure of, of plasma uh, and, and uh, residence time in the water, uh, which is also self-cooling, uh, so there's little or no electrode erosion. And it's also a reliable, scalable solution. So just imagine a two and a half inch diameter reactor of a hydrocyclone that can flow 90 gallons a minute. And uh, you're able, uh, with just 12 reactors on a single skid, uh, to scale up to 1,000 gallons a minute. Next slide. So what is plasma? Briefly, uh, for a, a background, you know, we're not talking about the clear part of your blood. Uh, we're talking about the fourth state of matter, right? So solid, liquid, gas, plasma. If you energize any gas to the point where some of the electrons start falling off, it becomes luminous and highly energetic. Um, lightning is a plasma. The sun is a plasma. Uh, it's the most common form of matter in the universe. Uh, here uh, on Earth, uh, we have uh, man-made, pla human-made plasmas in the, in, that are common and ubiquitous in lighting and displays, the old plasma TVs, uh, as well as most uh, forms of lighting. Uh, many forms of lighting these days are ionized gases. Um, air plasmas are easy. Uh, you just create a voltage gradient between two electrodes and the gas in between uh, the electrodes can be easily ionized. Um, Liquid plasma is much harder because of the short circuit quenching and snuffing problem that I mentioned. Um, and we've been able to overcome that successfully using on vectors proprietary technology. Next slide. So this is a very busy slide and uh, uh, it's intentional uh, to show you that there's no silver bullet in water treatment. On the left hand side, you can see different types of industrial wastewater treatment. And plasma fits into a category that we call advanced oxidation and disinfection. Um, there's no uh, a single solution that can perfectly treat every industrial water stream. Uh, plasma uh, doesn't do filtration. We don't remove suspended solids uh, as membranes and filters can do. Uh, plasma uh, you know, doesn't remove dissolved metals like lead or arsenic or selenium. So there are other technologies that are needed for that. Uh, and as you can see, um, every solution will require multiple uh, uh, methods uh, to create the proper train uh, of equipment. On the right-hand side, you know, it's a little small, uh, but this is just AOP, so just advanced oxidation processes uh, like ozone, UV, peroxide, et cetera, have many, many applications within industry. And so this is a, a truly um, a platform uh, with a widespread application uh, set. Next slide. So why is plasma uh, the holy grail in AOP? Why has this been pursued for many, many years uh, by so many labs? Um, why is plasma more robust and powerful than ozone or UV alone? Uh, AOP is the fastest growing segment in uh, water and wastewater treatment equipment. And uh, um, as you can imagine, you know, UV for municipal water systems or ozone and in industry, um, you know, they're widely used. Plasma creates ozone, creates UV. Uh, when you have uh, this electron cascade, multiple radical species are released. So not just ozone and UV, but also peroxide, singlet oxygen, and of course, hydroxyl radicals, which are the most powerful oxidant, most powerful radical, you can see there on the chart on the left, twice as strong uh, per molecule um, if you go back uh, than chlorine or chlorine dioxide. So, so uh, uh, it is, uh, um, as we say, a battleship that fires all guns, not just one form of ammunition, but multiple radical species are delivered. And that's why plasma is much more robust and efficient than ozone or UV alone. Next slide. So by 2018, we developed a prototype of our cyclone. And you can see there, um, water enters tangentially at the top, 
creating a cyclone. There's nowhere for it to go so that it exits out the top in the center. Um, and that is a typical reverse vortex tornado, not a spiral, but a tornado. And uh, uh, we add a, an electrode set at the bottom uh, with um, gas injected. We can inject any kind of gas. Um, air is pretty cost effective. Uh, and you connect with a generator and we deliver the voltage gradient right there at the electrode set. And we ignite um, essentially ionized gas arc lightning inside high flowing water. Uh, so it's an elegant design uh, that provides cooling um, and, and no electrode erosion, uh, as well as a, a stable gap uh, so that prevents um, short, sec short circuit quenching. Next slide. If you click on the figure, um, you, you'll uh, start a video and um, you know it's just a few seconds long showing uh, plasma. Um, Water is entering at the top there and uh, uh, tangentially, um, and then it exits at the very top at the center, and you can see the mixture of gas and liquid flowing out. At the bottom, there is a compressed air line uh, connected uh, to an electrode set and a power supply generator, and you have reliable plasma uh, that can be delivered um, you know, very stable in, in a scalable fashion. Next slide. So what we had in uh, uh, 2018 is what you saw there, uh, two to five kilowatts of plasma power up to 30 gallons a minute. Next slide. Um, there were successful treatability tests with commercial partners that were occurring in our lab uh, with our lab-based demo system. Uh, but the prototype required a, a trained operator uh, to run. And uh, we saw the need uh, to, uh, you know, in terms of crossing the chasm, uh, to create a fieldable commercial pilot system uh, with fully integrated power and flow controls and a one button start capability. And the Mass EC Catalyst program funded that, uh, and that's been extraordinarily helpful for us in terms of catalyzing opportunities for paid commercial pilot programs in the field uh, that are leading to commercial sales. Next slide. So here's the system we developed uh, thanks to the Mass CEC Catalyst Program. Um, you know, the, re the reactor looks more robust. It's similar in geometry. Um, you know, in the center there, you see the hole in the block where water enters tangentially and it'll flow through the tubular reactor, uh, go up the top in the center. Uh, and uh, on the right, you see, um, you know, the system we constructed, uh, those flow control valves, those are blue and, and the pump at the bottom. Um, and we've called out the reactor uh, is a red dotted line. Um, you can see there, I think that uh, multiple reactors can easily fit on a single skid. Even there, you could probably fit five or six reactors and increase the flow from 90 to upwards of a 500 gallons a minute. Um, you know, with 12 reactors on a single skid manifolded in parallel, you could easily run 1,000 gallons a minute. So this is not an academic plasma, uh, but it's designed to be reliable and fully scalable um, as it's currently uh, uh, designed. Next slide. And click on the video if you would, uh, just to show a quick uh, demo uh, of the, the plasma system. Thank you so much. You have there, um, we believe the most advanced plasma water technology in the world uh, flowing, um, you know, 20 to 90 gallons a minute with two to eight kilowatts of plasma power delivered stable, uh, reliably arc lightning uh, in, a, in a scalable reactor module. Next slide. Sorry about the video there. Obviously, we're broadcasting on the internet. I think if you can just go to the next slide, we, we'll, we'll advance the, the presentation. So Mass EC there is in the middle, um, and, and we're grateful for the uh, extraordinary support that we've got gained from Mass EC in terms of advancing uh, and crossing the chasm from, from lab to, to the field. Um, we've also received a, a voucher um, in, from Massachusetts in collaboration with Amherst, 
and that enables us to use their analytical laboratories uh, for testing of uh, PFAS, PFAS Forever Chemicals, which I'll be talking about uh, in, in a little bit, uh, as well as uh, a few other uh, sponsors uh, and partners uh, for research grants, including recently uh, the EPA, uh, another PFAS-related project um, from uh, EPA uh, for SBIR, and that's a phase one. Uh, from the Air Force, uh, we received an SBIR uh, middle of last year, and, and that's advancing into phase two, uh, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that as well. Next slide. So the key, obviously, when you have a platform technology with so many applications, it really is uh, like having a tiger by the tail. Sounds like a good thing, but it's actually extraordinarily challenging for a startup. Uh, the key, you know, we need to focus. You know, this this uh, is uh, critical for our success to build uh, a strong beachhead uh, where we have commercial growth, uh, and we are, um, and that's been our our, our key focus uh, in in uh, recent months. Next slide. As, a, as I mentioned, we performed a treatability test in the laboratory uh, for a pharmaceutical uh, company uh, successfully uh, for a stream that was previously incinerated. And um, after we constructed the system, or as we were constructing a syst the system under the Mass CEC funded project, we gained some commercial traction with cruise ships. Cruise lines have uh, very unique water treatment issues. And, and I'd like to focus a, a, for a couple minutes on, on that beachhead segment. Uh, and, but the, the third, besides PharmaChem and cruise lines, uh, in, in our scope has been uh, uh, groundwater remediation for PFAS, forever chemicals. Um, next slide. So this is the traction that we were rapidly developing in 2019. And uh, um, you know, cruise lines have extraordinary water needs. Um, wastewater releases on uh, from cruise ships result in criminal fines that some of you may have heard about in the national news. There's a whole new set of regulations coming called VITA, a Vessel Incidental Discharge Act, which is re regulating all emissions, all pollutions and discharges from all vessels. And that was passed by Congress and is in the implementation stage. So uh, there's rapid evolution going on in the regulatory environment for uh, marine vessels, including and especially cruise lines. Now, outbreaks obviously negatively impact human health and uh, cruise brands. And, and um, I, um, you know, will address the elephant in the room in terms of, uh, of uh, the current situation in the cruise lines, uh, uh, but in the cruise industry. Uh, but first, let me just talk through uh, some of the work that was done. Next slide. Uh, in the lab, we can show. Uh, extraordinarily robust and efficient disinfection of water and wastewater. Uh, so this is uh, on the left, you see um, high salinity water uh, and, and, and on the right, you know, moderate salinity. Our technology also works in tap water and uh, the uh, um, dark block shows post-treatment and, and uh, the lighter uh, histogram shows um, pre-treatment. And essentially, you know, we can disinfect 99.99% uh, with a single pass through plasma, uh, 0.8 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. So a ton of water, a uh, cubic meter of water, um, you know, a nickel of electricity. Uh, you know, this is extraordinarily efficient uh, um, platform. Next slide. We took this technology, uh, which we uh, uh, built in a fieldable skid with one button start on board a cruise vessel and tested their gray water. Gray water is uh, a key stream on board uh, of the five uh, core water streams on board a cruise vessel that is about to begin to be regulated. And we're talking about, you know, laundry, galleys or, or kitchens, uh, accommodation, showers, uh, the gray water uh, coming out uh, from uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, vessel uh, uses. And we were successful. Uh, so we tested and, and uh, successfully completed a, a, a trial on board a, a cruise vessel. The BOD, the biological oxygen demand, what was brought down, essentially oxidation occurred beyond uh, two and beyond the target levels. Uh, we tried four, uh, three different configurations there. Uh, one pass through plasma, five passes through the reactor, and then five passes with a small amount of peroxide injected. There you see it is a, a very good clarification and, and the best results. 
so we inject small amounts of, of, of oxidant through the electrode itself, uh, and, and we can create a, a, a multitude of effects. And we like to joke that the periodic table is our app store. Uh, so you know you can hit any one of, uh, of these uh, uh, additives and, and add a trace amounts into a plasma reactor and create you know activated uh, series of, of radical reactions. Next slide. So um, you know obviously we have a, um, a unique and unprecedented situation in, in the cruise industry. Uh, we anticipate that. Um, the cruise lines will come back, and uh, uh, you know, partly because the economics of, of, of uh, a cruise vacation are superior to a land-based vacation. And there is a need and a market for the cruise industry. They provide uh, and deliver uh, to a, a, a legitimate demand in the marketplace, and their econo their environmental um, constraints uh, will be continuing to increase, and there'll be increased needs for sustainability. Uh, technology, and we believe uh, in the months and years ahead uh, that that is a, a an important and viable uh, beachhead market, a uh, niche market. However, um, we have in fact uh, pivoted uh, to a degree uh, to our our alternate uh, beachhead market, which is uh, the PFAS Forever Chemicals. Um, and can I ask you to move forward one slide first? So these are uh, a family of thousands of compounds that are human made uh, that have been around for 80 years. And uh, you may have uh, heard about them in the, in the national news, but if you haven't, I would highly recommend you Google PFAS Forever Chemicals. Uh, this is an important issue. I would say, you know, number one out of the three key emerging uh, contaminants, uh, along with, you know, the microplastics and the residual uh, pharmaceuticals in our water supply, uh, PFAS is number one. and the reason is the carbon fluorine bond is the most stable in all uh, uh, of all of chemistry. Um, you know, they uh, these these materials are, are extremely hard to remove. Can we go back one slide? Just back one slide. So these materials uh, uh, were invented uh, and uh, uh, by by humans and, and widely used. Just think your nonstick frying pan, stain resistant clothes, carpets, upholstery. Uh, firefighting foam. So these materials were ubiquitous. Scotchgard, Teflon, these are all PFAS. Um, and the material, because it's, its greatest strength is also its weakness, right? Um, it's so stable that you can't get rid of it. Uh, it's very, or rather, it's very difficult. Uh, at trace levels, we're talking parts per billion, parts per trillion levels, uh, are it's harmful for humans. Uh, we're talking about liver disease, liver cancers, fetal developmental problems. Uh, it's an extraordinarily uh, uh, harmful and, and a ubiquitous problem. The material bioaccumulates, so it takes a long time to remove from the body. And again, it's ubiquitous. If you go to Whole Foods and buy a bottle of water, uh, you'll find PFAS in there. There is PFAS in every one of your bodies, uh, and, and it is in, ubiquitous in, in groundwater, soil. Uh, um, it's an extraordinarily important and common problem. Plasma vortex destroys PFAS. Uh, can you just advance two slides, please? So we've tested, um, and, and the analytics was performed by UMass Amherst at, at a, um, you know, sort of a, a key thought-leading laboratory uh, in environmental and civil engineering. Um, depending on the initial concentration, the efficacy uh, of plasma oxidation uh, differs, but we are able to show um, strong oxidation of PFAS, one of the most well-studied PFAS compounds using plasma. With additional cycling through the reactor, uh, we can definitely bring it down to non-detectable levels. Next slide. So even within the PFAS beachhead, there are segments, and our focus here is on the first two. Uh, so firefighting foam, aqueous film-forming foam, has been used routinely not just at fire departments and fire training areas, but at air bases, uh, military bases, air force bases, uh, for decades. These materials have been used routinely. So you have high levels of contamination in the DOD, in military bases, also manufacturing facilities, especially those that manufacture PFAS compounds, you have uh, uh, high levels of contamination. 
Next slide. On Vector has been awarded an SBIR from the Air Force, U.S. Air Force, which is advancing into phase two. Uh, you know, uh, we have uh, um, MOUs from um, Joint Base Cape Cod uh, for phase two installation of uh, our plasma vortex technology uh, for uh, um, you know known PFAS contaminated groundwater, and then also a phase three MOU um, from the installation of the future, uh, which is down in Florida. Uh, it's a large facility. Uh, so we have some initial DOD traction that we're building in this important beachhead market, which is our current focus uh, for Plasma Vortex. Next slide. Our revenue model is equipment sales. You know, so we can sell to the facilities, the end users, or engineering firms who often do uh, design builds and, and can operate the system as well. Um, you know, over 1,500 known contaminated sites and growing, uh, 650 plus uh, military sites with, ground, with known groundwater contamination. Ultimately, and I think that most experts in the water industry understand this, every public water system in the U.S. Uh, is going to need to require PFAS treatment. So even though there are immediate applications, immediate and urgent opportunities for us now, um, you know, the regulations are, are evolving and, um, and, and it will take time. Uh, and ultimately, every water system in the United States is going to require PFAS treatment. Next slide. Our strategy is to execute on these Air Force installations and then begin, uh, you know, deeper collaborations with the environmental consulting firms, the engineering firms that remediate PFAS, um, then grow by seeking partnerships with uh, key equipment companies, um, granular activated carbon, GAC or GAC, as well as ion exchange uh, are methods that uh, can be um, connected and used synergistically with plasma vortex. And then moving into the industrial site installations, as well as our earlier uh, market segments of pharma and chem wastewater and process water treatment. Uh, so this is uh, our sales strategy, but it, it highlights our emphasis, our current emphasis in the DOD. Next slide. Our team um, is small, but diverse and very strong. Um, I come from, initially from MedTech. I uh, worked at a company called Realogix, came up through the ranks and, and, and led, uh, it was a medical diagnostics company. And then around 15 years ago, toggled over uh, to uh, water treatment, serving at, as a consultant to the water industry, uh, principal consultant for companies like Pentair and IMI and GE. Um, down at the lower left, my father has been my research partner for decades, a former NASA scientist, uh, faculty at Drexel University in Philadelphia, um, you know, well-recognized water tech in innovator. And then in the middle there, uh, Dr. Rich Higgins, who's got a doctorate from MIT and comes from Veolia, uh, which is a, a leading uh, water technology company. And prior to that, Sarah Mem, uh, with start, so he has startup and, and small company experience as well. Uh, he's provide, uh, proving to be uh, extraordinarily uh, valuable in leading our, our, our technical integration and, and development efforts. Uh, my business partner, Joe Henderson, there on the right, comes from private equity and has emerging growth as well as a uh, large company experience, led Cytogen, uh, the publicly listed biotech company, uh, during its turnaround and uh, um, has been instrumental in, in our, our corporate execution here. Um, and then Fred Neal, just rounding it out, um, physicist, electrical engineer, working on the power supplies, designing and implementing our power electronics, which is an important part of our technology. Uh, it comes from the Fermi Lab and, and Philips and General Dynamics. Next slide. Uh, you know, strong advisory network. This is uh, just some of our advisors, including former AECOM uh, applications engineers, as well as uh, uh, Kathy Ward, who's um, you know chemist and environmental consultant, uh, but serves as an environmental attorney. Uh, extraordinary uh, uh, resource for us, um, and that rounds out our advisory board. Next slide. So we're located at Greentown Labs. Uh, we have two locations: our rapid prototyping facility. A, a location at Greentown and our primary locus of, of growth. Uh, we also have a small treatability lab outside of uh, Philadelphia 
um, and King of Prussia. And, and um, you know, that is a, a, a background and introduction to our company. I'm happy to take any of your questions. Great, thank you. Um, a reminder to all the attendees, please submit your questions in the question box and then I will ask them on your behalf. Um, to start it off, um, you mentioned partnering with Iron Exchange and GAC, but not reverse osmosis. Is that because your process replaces reverse osmosis? No, I. Um, th there could be opportunities to uh, pre-treat RO water um, for instance, in, in desal or certain industrial streams, in our view, RO actually is not a good fit for PFAS, forever chemicals remediation, insofar as there's a reject stream, right? So RO um, pushes water through a membrane and you have, let's say, just for example, 20% of the water uh, is concentrated reject and 80%, is, you know, the permeate is what you use. Uh, so what do you do with that reject stream? You've just concentrated your PFAS. In the case of GAC, all the water is treated. Also with ion exchange, all of the water is treated. So in the PFAS world, and this is just our opinion, other uh, uh, folks can, can to disagree, uh, membrane technology is actually not uh, the ideal uh, modality for groundwater remediation for PFAS. Other applications like desal you know membrane is clearly uh, 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 central uh, and ro in particular uh, is clearly central uh, as well as many many industrial and, and commercial applications got it and then could you explain a bit more precisely how your technology interacts with ion exchange and gac sure um so those are two different examples, uh, um, but for GAC, a pretreatment of water going into GAC can extend the life of GAC uh, between changeouts, uh, basically pushing through, pushing back breakthrough, PFAS breakthrough on the GAC vessel, uh, meaning uh, your GAC can last longer in between uh, changeouts uh, for the carbon media. Uh, alternatively, uh, there is some thought to using plasma vortex as polishing post GAC uh, to knock down the small chain PFAS that break through. Um, for ion exchange, and, and you know, this is uh, an evolving uh, space and, and we have um, high regard for ion exchange as, as a potential future workhorse uh, in PFAS remediation uh, insofar as uh, the empty bed contact times for ion exchange are going to be much, much lower than GAC. Uh, so the footprint, the physical footprint, and, and ultimately the cost of ion exchange may ultimately be very, very much superior to GAC. So, you know, and these market dynamics uh, uh, need to sort of play out. Uh, but in, in our case, you know, we can treat, um, you know, the regenerants, uh, uh, you know, the stream that's used to regenerate the ion exchange, any concentrated waste that comes out of the ion exchange uh, system would be ideal for plasma treatment. Got it. Um, and then in regards to kind of like the regulatory landscape, are you speaking with DEP or EPA um, to see if there's any like specific data collection necessary um, to make you attractive from a regulatory perspective? Yes. Yeah, so that is a, a complicated question and answer. Um, EPA regulates the two common uh, PFAS compounds, PFOS and PFOA. Um, and there's, I think, widespread belief in the industry that uh, uh, those levels are too high. Uh, so there's going to be further regulation eventually, uh, whether in one or five years or, or, or sometime in the future. Um, states, many states uh, are regulating uh, more than just the two uh, well-known PFAS com compounds at much lower levels. Uh, and, and there are additional regulations coming online. So that's a very complex and evolving uh, framework. And I think it relates to drinking water primarily. Um, in terms of known contaminated industrial and military sites, um, you know, I think it's a different story. We're talking about orders of magnitude higher PFAS concentration. Uh, so uh, um, you know, those opportunities can, 
can and are being attacked um, independent of, uh, of e EPA and DEP. Got it, thank you. Um, just a reminder to everyone in the audience to please type in your questions in the question box. Um, and um, there's one question on your IP strategy. Um, if you can maybe go a bit more into what patent applications or um, granted patents you have to date. Um, one patent issued, five more pending. I think that um, you know our team is is quite experienced and strategic when it comes to IP portfolio. You know, with humility, I can, I think I can say that we are building the definitive patent wall for plasma water. Uh, we patent. Uh, we we have a, a product vision which is incorporating plasma into existing filtration and separa separation methods. So the hydrocyclone is an existing filtration and separation method, and we've integrated and patented a, a plasma hydrocyclone. Likewise, with GAC, uh, you know, car GAC is conductive, so we can use GAC as an electrode, and we've patented around that. Uh, it's and, and and et cetera, et cetera, with uh, let's just say stainless steel screen filters, which can be used as a, an electrode. Uh, we envision a future where there's an array of filtration tools that are lit up with fire and lightning, able to disinfect and oxidize uh, water and wastewater. So we're patenting base patents around those future pr product modalities. Within Plasma Vortex, the hydrocyclone, we also have incremental patents like the plasma stretching uh, and, and other smaller, um, you know, innovations that, that aren't necessarily base patents, uh, but but capture our performance-enhancing know-how. Great, thank you. Um, and then one other um, technical question. Um, does your technology bypass the need for using flocculants in um, like water treatment for food processing? The last part, um, flocculants and water treatment for? Food processing. Yeah, um, I think in some of my earlier slides, uh, I try to depict, you know, how broad um you know the industry application set is and I, you know the short answer to, to that i would say no uh, on the flocculation um you know clarification flocculation digesters um you know these methods work uh, so you know your sewage your wastewater at your municipality you know follows um established methods uh that that uh, um are you know work and are economic uh, short answer is no. We we don't uh, desire to replace uh, the, those uh, treatment methods at this at this stage. Um, you know, in terms of food, so we, so we we are going after the very high cost, high contamination, high strength streams that are difficult for others to treat, that are uniquely suitable for some robust arc lightning type of, of plasma technology, uh, rather than uh, sort of a uh, um, you know, the lower cost, well-established, uh, easy for everyone else to do uh, opportunities. Um, in terms of food processing, FMB is very important. Food and beverage is in a very important space. Uh, there are uh, existing methods uh, that, that are being used. In terms of toxicity and, and hazards, it's not the most attractive, uh, the most challenging uh, market segment uh, 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 for, for OnVector. But in the long term, uh, we, we may uh, more closely at FMB uh, in the future. Got it. Um, and then, are you looking to expand to overseas markets as well, or are you currently just focused on the U.S. market? We are currently focused on the U.S. Um, you know, in around three years ago, OnVector won uh, the China Blue Tech Award, um, which was at AquaTech China, uh, a large conference in, in Shanghai. Um, you know, we have excellent contacts in Asia, including China. China and India surely are the most important environmental markets in the world, uh, and, and, you know, long term. Uh, we are not focused on overseas markets at present. Um, you know, we have had various dialogues uh, uh, with, with uh, potential partners, but our, our primary focus is in the U.S. 
it's less costly uh, to run pilots uh, that are closer, uh, obviously. And uh, um, it's actually, you know, the current envir uh, business environment uh, is, uh, we believe, better uh, for uh, domestic focus uh, uh, rather than, than overseas. And ultimately, uh, we'll, we'll, we will need to uh, expand into key areas like China and India, uh, but that hasn't been uh, uh, initiated as of yet. Got it. Um, and then you mentioned cruise lines as one particular market. Um, what kind of capital outlay, outlay is required per ship? And um, you mentioned a low energy requirement, but how do the operating costs of your technology compare to current methods today? So um, there are some apples to apples comparisons uh, that can be made, uh, but also just remember that um, you know, if you just look at the national news, uh, criminal fines have been levied on multiple cruise lines uh, because of wastewater releases. So this is to say that uh, there are disruptions uh, in, in uh, um, wastewater and water treatment processes on board vessels, that the, the treatment flows are, are, are not continuous, they're, they're intermittent, and there can be surges uh, in, in the waste content that uh, create disruptions in things like digesters and, and existing processes. All this to say, um, it's not that we're coming in to, to compete uh, exclusively with existing solutions that work well uh, on the basis of pricing, but rather filling a need uh, and gaps uh, uh, where treatment, um, you know, more treatment is needed. Additionally, there are these new regulations, the VITA regulations that I referenced, that are going to cause a whole new set of streams uh, to be regulated that aren't currently regulated, for example, gray water on board uh, marine vessels. Um, that said, our uh, approximate price point for um, uh, around uh, uh, 90 gallons a minute uh, is around 180 thou, uh, 185 thou. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we benchmark high-end ozone for cruise lines. The economics uh, on land-based applications uh, can be much, much tighter, and we're prepared for that. Um, and the inputs uh, for elect are, are essentially electricity, and, and uh, um, you know, we, we can provide uh, more details about uh, the OPEX requirements of, of our, of our um, equipment. Just, uh, just one more point, if I may. Let's say on a large cruise vessel, you know, um, maybe five of those systems uh, would be necessary, uh, you know, approximately 180,000, uh, around five of those uh, systems of that flow rate would, would be uh, appropriate to treat all the, all the sanitary water. Uh, and then a, a similar uh, um, size uh, flow rate uh, for, for the wastewater. Great, thank you. Um, I think those are all of the questions we have for today. So it was a great presentation. It was a great, um, from the Mass EC perspective, to get an update on um, your Catalyst project and what you're doing right now in terms of commercialization and technical development. Um, thank you to the audience for your engagement. And um, I think that concludes today's presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you to uh, all of your attendees. And uh, you know we welcome uh, contact uh, uh, in the numbers or email that you see on the screen. And thank you to Mass EC for your uh, continued support and, and for this opportunity to, to connect. Yeah, have a great day.